now being recorded. Um, so welcome. Uh, we have an informal discussion to get, today in our clean call. I am Don Haas, the Director of Teacher Programming at the Paleontological Research Institution and your facilitator for today. Um, we're a small group, so maybe just go around and say who you are and where you're from, and then we'll go to announcements after that. Frank, you want to, Frank N, you want to go first? Sure, happy to be Frank N. Um, where did I get to be another Frank in here? So I'm Frank Niepold. Uh, under my new title, I am the uh, Action for Climate Empowerment National Focal Point for the United States. I'm one of two. Um, I'm out of NOAA, and uh, I am a current chair of the Clean Leadership Board, but I am up for stepping down in September. So happy to be with you all. You want me to pick somebody? Sure. How about we go, Beth? Nice to see you, Beth. Okay, good morning, everybody. I am here in part because Patrick Chandler is a new dad, cutest baby in the world, Excellent. named Brooke. Excellent. And I know that we had things that we were, I, I just thought I'd chime in for the half hour that I have available. And um, with the University of Colorado, I'm a theater professor, also teach with environmental studies. I recently just saw a video entitled um, Call Them In by Chris Matthews that has Frank in the video. Frank, did you get my email? You're in the video. It's I'll put it in the chat. It's so cool. It's such a, it was the um, John Lewis um, voting rights thing. They showed this video and um, it was, oh my gosh, Patrick's on. I already spilled his news. Um, anyway, but Frank, you have to check out the video on this thing because they come to the door and you open up the door. And it's oh, resistor hood. Yeah, it was so yeah, 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 a good yeah. song. Anyway, I'm here for, in there for a second. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm here to represent the arts being a powerful force in doing what we do Thanks. with my friend Patrick, who just joined in. I can't believe he was able to. We might make him go get that baby and show us. Okay, and I call on Laura Love. You're on mute, Laura. Hey, I'm Laura Love, and I'm the learning producer of a music and education festival. It's called Get Off the Grid Fest. It's three days of music, learning, and fun powered by the sun. And um, just, just I join these calls to get ideas uh, about how to design the learning program to uh, to get the most information across in an engaging way. You wanna pick somebody to go next? Um, Wendy. Well, thank you for that. Hi everybody, Wendy Abshire. I am the director of the American Meteorological Society's education program. It's a 30 year program offering teachers professional development in weather, ocean and climate science. And um, I'm a member of the clean board and I get a lot of inspiration and great ideas from this group too. Um, I'll just randomly pop, pop, uh, pick Ginger because I like her red chair and it's showing up in my screen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Ginger Weinerman. I am um, working for the Washington State Department of Ecology on Hanford Nuclear Cleanup and do informal science education in my community and I'm hoping we have some new laws that pass the legislature, Washington legislature to finally maybe make some meaningful changes in climate stuff through the agency. Because <laughs> it's actually been really a lot of talk and not a whole lot of action up here. And, um, and also we have an a new environmental justice law that passed in Washington. So I'm excited to see where we can um, improve that when we're doing climate education, you know, do the cross disciplinary stuff. Let's see, how about Art, have you introduced yourself yet? Because I was late. Okay, uh, my name is Art Sussman and uh, I haven't been that involved with the uh, climate discussion group for a couple of years, especially during the pandemic. 
And before that, there were some uh, health issues in my family, which are all resolved. Um, and I'm back here. I'm, I worked at a place called West Ed for multiple decades. And I'm a <clears throat> PhD biochemist, but my career has been all about uh, helping K-12 education systems and public understanding uh, focused on global environmental issues. As I got involved in education, uh, became uh, apparent to me that the environmental ed groups were mostly doing local environmental ed, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but back in the 90s, there was very little that they were doing around uh, global environmental ed. So I kind of picked that up and that's been my passion anyway. Uh, so I'm glad to be back. And um, I'm in the middle of writing a book on uh, climate change. I've done a couple of books that were fairly popular. Um, a book on climate change um, that's graphic and aimed at like a 12 year old to a hundred year old. Wanna pick somebody to go next? Oh, I can't, uh, Frank Grancha. Okay, now I think I'm unmuted. Well, I'm Frank Grancha, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm here to confuse things by having two Franks in the mix. Um, and uh, oh, let's see, um, like some of, uh, I, I'm, I do a lot of different things. I'm retired uh, a geology instructor, now doing uh, um, climate education for non-science majors at Portland State. Spend some time vir organizing uh, virtual bridges to UNF Triple C events, and um, am in the second iteration of resource manual, at, which I gave a talk about here in the Clean Network. I'm going to say probably about six or eight months ago, and at that time I was looking for reviewers. Well, I'm getting to the point where I will definitely be looking for reviewers. And Patrick, I'll move on to you, but sometime along the way, I want to see this kid of yours. All right, let me get my one hand zoom controls down here. Uh, all right, I should make a brief appearance. This is baby Brooke. She's uh, all up in here. So uh -huh. it's a pretty good reason to focus on um, the climate, I guess. <laughs> A little camera shy. Oh, she's <laughs> but, uh, Yeah, I'll be I'll be in and out today, as might be expected. But I thought I'd say hello. Right, Wait, see. hold her up better. You both. Yes. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on, Beth. What's her name again? Uh, Brooke. Brooke. I love so, it. She's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Is everybody um, doing well, Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. It was a long week last week, but uh, <laughs> this one is off to a good start. Uh, baby mama doing well. I'm on the night shift right now, so if I babble incoherently, forgive me. Um, so you're lactating, Patrick? Is that it now? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a neat trick, wouldn't it? <laughs> now a little Only humans have the ability system. to do that. Yeah. A little different system than that. Um, other than this adventure, I focus on art and science partnerships to catalyze community action on environmental and social justice issues. You said that once or twice, I think. Yep, <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know who has not gone. So if you haven't gone, you should go. I don't think we've heard from Emily, Melissa, or Jim, or Katie. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, Patrick. <laughs> I'm thanks. very happy for you. Um, I'm Emily Corin. I do, I'm in the psychiatry and psychology department at Stanford. Um, I have been adapting entertainment education tactics uh, for public health communication for climate communication in the US. I'm going to call on Nancy because she just popped in. I'm Nancy Gluckrenick and I work with Emily. I'm also in Santa Cruz and working as part of the Santa Cruz climate action planning process and tying, seeking to tie it in with our uh, ACE project that Frank 
and Deb and Tama have been leading. And uh, just note that we have a meeting lined up this week with the staff of our Congressman Frank Panetta, who's on Ways and Means in the hopes of furthering his support for funding this good work. Awesome. And I don't know who's gone yet. So how about Laura? Have you gone yet? She has. But yes, how, James, I don't think is gone. Yeah, I see Melissa just on you. Okay. So okay, well, thanks. I'll be brief. Uh, Jim Callahan or James Callahan, climatechangeeducation.org and the Mobile Climate Science Labs. And I'm going to see, I always like to get the Melissa, if, if you're up for stuff, I don't think we've hit you yet, have we? Did we get Melissa? That's my turn, I think. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm Melissa Rummel. I work at the UCAR Center for Science Education, part of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, I think UCAR used to be more involved in these meetings a while ago, and then we, I guess, got busy and kind of took a break, but now we've just kind of decided that we feel like everything that's being talked about here is important and we want to keep our finger on the pulse and see where we can engage. So um, you'll probably see myself and then um, my colleague and Emily Snowd Burneman and Tiffany, Tiffany Foreman, we're kind of rotating who attends, but we're trying to attend all of the meetings. But um, I'm an educational designer. I used to be a high school science teacher in Colorado for a long time. Um, I do professional development for teachers and write a lot of content and classroom activities about atmospheric sciences and climate and earth systems. So. Okay, and uh, yeah, we haven't heard from Tiffany or Katie yet, I think. All right, I'll jump in. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tiffany Boyd and Beth, I just dropped off Ellery at the border and she's starting her internship in El Paso. So speaking of babies, right? My baby is now helping down on the border. So my daughter Ellery works with Beth and the amazing Chelsea. So. Yeah, so Tiffany Boyd, I'm the director of Classrooms for Climate Action, and I'm a retired uh, Boulder Valley School District teacher. I live now in Louisville, Colorado. So what we do is we take retired teachers who have bandwidth and CU students who have bandwidth, and we help teachers who have none. So we help teachers um, fit climate into anything they are teaching, whether it be uh, social justice or science or persuasive writing, um, how to protect the pollinators and we weave climate into anything they're teaching and we give students a voice. We've had lots of students testify in front of Colorado legislators on bills that are being passed left and right here in Colorado. And um, so yeah, so that's me. And then I guess, Katie, back to you. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Boyd. I'm the Clean Program Manager and I otherwise work at Ceres Education and Outreach, which we, um, our group helps manage clean. And I do this half the time. And then the other half the time I work on um, research and evaluation on some of our other educational projects that we do. So, uh, and just FYI, I have to leave halfway through the call today, but I'm looking forward to the discussion for the next little bit while I'm here. Okay, that, that took a little bit longer than I expected because the crowd doubled well uh, while we were introducing ourselves, which is great. Um, so, uh, announcements. Stuff you want to talk about. Go ahead, Laura. Ah, uh, so... <clears throat> Like I said in the introduction, I've planned the learning program for the uh, this music and education festival. I've put together about 70 speakers who come to do presentations. I've been thinking about um, kind of conceptualizing a presentation that I'll be looking, let me start again. I also conceptualize what topics would make good presentations and then I look for community organizations within about um, 50 to 100, between the exact location and about 100 miles out. So this year we're going to be in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga is where Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee come together. Um, and anyway, what I was thinking about is I was trying to find a topic that tied together food and agriculture and energy and environment. 
and is a topic that was for people that are already invested in climate change and agree that climate change is occurring and uh, they want to know what they can do about it. And the topic would have some, it be easy to lend itself to personal action steps. So the topic I was thinking about was something on the carbon cycle. And this is what I wanted to ask you all today is how much prior knowledge do you think adults have about the carbon cycle? And, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's a good idea then. <laughs> and what are some of the high points that should be hit? Because usually I, I ask the organizations, okay, what do you wanna speak on? And they really look towards some guidance about what topic they'll choose. And a lot of them want to go off from their everyday topics to just have something fresh to speak about. So if you were trying to get somebody to speak about the uh, carbon cycle and it's at a music festival, <laughs> uh, so it's informal and um, they have either 20 minutes or 45 minutes to present on it. What are some of the th uh, things that you think should be in there and what could be a catchy title for it? Well, one, one I have actually talked about this quite a bit. Uh, so I have props handy. Um, so here's a block of graphite that's two by two by six inches. Graphite's essentially pure carbon. How do you think this compares to the amount of carbon in a gallon of gasoline? Is it a lot more, a lot less, about the same? What do you think? Well, maybe there is a little bit more because the gasoline is liquid. Maybe. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you, that's about a third of the amount of uh, carbon in a gallon of gasoline. Uh, gasoline is 87% carbon by weight. A gallon of gas weighs about six pounds. Um, so it's got five and a half pounds of carbon in it, <laughs> which um, <laughs> happens to be about the amount of carbon in an eight foot two by four, which is why that's my profile picture. Um, so an eight foot two by four weighs about 11 pounds and wood is about half carbon. So it also has about five and a half pounds of carbon in it. So that's, uh, those are some thoughts. <laughs> um, and I'll, uh, I'll pull up uh, info on that and put it in the chat. You know, Laura, where I come from on this one is while that that fact is is, you know, surprising, putting it into the, the 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 context of our moment, like how many gallons of gas are we going through in this country in a year um, and how much of our of our carbon budget do we have left together, all of humanity in order to hit our carbon targets? related to, cl to the climate goals that come out of the Paris Agreement. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of pieces, but one thing that I think everybody on this call will, will appreciate and support is humans are terrible at systems. We're really, really, really bad at it. We don't understand it, we're not taught it. Um, and so when you put dynamic concepts into systems and then you magnify it by the number of people um, it gets, it, people get lost really fast. Um, we don't teach this. Most people have not, and I, I see Art can't just video came on. So <laughs> you uh, said by I word. I feeling I'm triggering Art and, you know, but I think that that's really where this, this, these, these facts put them in the context of a dynamic system relative to ca uh, carbon and climate goals. Um, that's where the, the, I think that what is most essential has to reside in, in like in that. So what, what do you mean by dynamic system? Well, I mean, because, you know, the, 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 the amount of carbon we emit uh -huh. is a very dynamic process. Uh, and, uh, you know, then, but then you throw in misconceptions, like how much carbon is in a gallon of gas when it hits the atmosphere after being burned. Um, and that, you know, there's a common misconception that people can't change climate. It's too big. We're too small. But we've extended our impact because of technology. Now, all the idea of horsepower, right? You know, 
you used to have a horse. When you have a car, the car is going, you know, 230 horsepower. That's technology expands our our uh, physical ability. So that there's like it, it gets it gets. What I think you're looking for is how do you take all of that complexity and get it into uh, a simple entry point? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I was also trying to think too, because I see that the carbon cycle not only speaks to renewable energy, so why is renewable energy so important, but it also speaks to other um, opportunities for mitigation, which is soil and planting trees. And so I thought it was a good way to combine some food and agriculture aspects we have of the festival, along with energy and environment. If I, if I could comment, picking up on what you're saying, Laura, this is a little bit bigger question, but there's a group of seventh graders that we're working with and there's some, to try to bring home um, a question they're asking or could be asking, that's close as you put it within their reach to think about or do something about. And the, the big phrase, this isn't quite there yet, but they are using it is how do we meet? How can we meet the needs of all by healing, not harming planet or people? And that gives the opportunity to focus on the healing capacities of regenerative agriculture and rewilding and restoring soil and mixing trees, uh, perennial, <coughs> perennials and so forth. There are some great images coming from Africa as well as this country, quite dramatic photos. I mean, just mind blowing to see how in a few years you can go from destroyed soils back into viable biosystems. And I think, and then go from that to really close to hand places where in, in near Chattanooga, those sorts of things are already going on. Things like eco, eco camps that young people can go to or visiting farms or supporting regenerative ag in your food purchasing and so forth. And I think it can be tied back that's what they're doing, at least with the seventh graders, to a relatively simple model of the carbon cycle. It's complicated the way I said it, but I think it could be done vividly as um, well, I, I kind of hands-on things that you're talking about. I appreciate your approach because you start first with looking at the solutions and how the solutions are healing, and then you go back to do the, <clears throat> then from there, you go back to the prior knowledge that's needed, which is what the carbon cycle is. Instead of starting off revising, reviewing the prior knowledge to see if somebody can remember what they learned in seventh grade <laughs> and then going on to healing. So that's, I, I like the way that that's put together there. So there are a bunch of hands up, so uh, I think Frank was next. Okay. So um, when Frank was talking, uh, there are a couple of things that crossed my mind that precipitated a, a couple of half-baked ideas. Um, it, it talked about um, humans being rather bad at systems and having this sense that, uh, okay, we're just one person. We, we're just individual people. We don't have that much impact on, on these larger scale systems. And there's a book that my wife had that she used with her kids. She's a retired teacher also, um, that has it's people in possessions. I think some of you may have seen this where people in different parts of the world are out in front of their houses with all their possessions spread out in front of them, photograph. And you really get this sense that these are, it's more than the individuals, it's all of these other things that are part of their lives. And I, I think that somehow that would be a cool thing to do with this notion of carbon emissions, et cetera. Um, 
so I think that's part of the piece of the puzzle that Laura, you're talking about the trying to grab people for 20 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that might be really nice. The dynamics part of things that Frank was talking about, not quite sure how you do that. I mean, I think Don's kind of got a little piece of the puzzle with the, with the brick. That's not a cricket, that's my bloody phone. Sorry about that. Um, and that's my bloody computer tied into my phone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that that that's probably enough rambling. So, yeah. As I said, technology is when systems are we're struggle at. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's Jim and then Ginger. Hi, and and, and Donna, I'm going to follow your lead. I I wanted to make a supportive comment on Laura and whether I should then jump into another announcement or let's keep talking about Laura's subject and do things, whichever, whichever you direct on things. Laura, just a thought, not necessarily this is the thing to do or you have to do this or something, but there's a thing of adjusting to the genre and the, and the opportunity. If there is anybody who can do music, who can sing a song, that's an opportunity. I mean, if you have a festival, I, I would think, you know, I mean, the tradition of Pete Seeker who is blacklisted and learned to sing, sing, sing children's songs and still be relevant and, and popular, he would involve the entire audience in singing a song of what are we going to be doing about climate change as a community. I mean, there's nothing like a, there's nothing like a music concert to, to bring up people's emotions and feel for They go home, I'm going to do something because I'm part of the community. I feel good about this. You can have your sad and angry moments, but just a thought on that. I mean, it could even be a speaker who can involve the band. If there's a band set up behind them, the band might be able to play along with it. I don't know. It's just an idea. But I, uh, today, by the way, I was on a conference with uh, Anaya Johnson, and she was bringing up how we're we're still lacking in having really good music on climate change. And I would I would we have good, but we could do better. Yeah, speaking to that, that's I've also been looking for some musicians. Um, to fill up uh, to put on the stages and that's the musicians may sing about their love for the environment but um they don't necessarily see their music as environmental activism there are a few out there who do but they were too expensive <laughs> for our stages because they have nationwide recognition and we were looking for people who have more regional recognition. And then also I'm leading a dialogue on communicating climate change and finding, of finding an artist for that has been, a regional artist for that has been difficult as well. I was hoping for a musician, but um, I've been looking all over Tennessee and I've had a hard time. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, Art, or no, Ginger was me. Um, so just real quick, I, I do want to, um, some of these ideas have been really, I think really great, um, Laura. And, and one of the things that I might suggest is maybe um, instead of having a presentation or maybe a, along with having a presentation, if you had some static displays, like, the idea of possessions if you if you created you know the average home in the the US i mean we all know what the average home in the US is so we don't need to create that perhaps but maybe like using like the pop up tents or whatever here is the average possessions of a person in mexico here's the average possessions of a person in in ghana or someplace else and create a visual and then have informational displays um, but you know, one of the things that I think we we all need to be careful about, with all due respect to drawdown, is the notion that the the carbon footprint and our personal responsibility, yes, it's important, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the oil companies, and they created that notion to put the blame on us, yeah, and to make us think it's our fault, and it is not our fault. They knowingly created this mess, so really trying to focus on if we're going to do behavior change, what are the most quality of life redeeming behavior changes? And I think like the biodynamic farming or supporting your local farmer's markets 
are the kinds of changes that then you build personal relationships. Like if you're going to the, to the farmer's market to buy your groceries, as opposed to Costco, you're building relationships, you're exchanging money, you're supporting better agriculture. And so instead of capturing it as a carbon footprint question, it's the community building and the regenerative agriculture um, question, because I just feel like there's a lot of stuff that is so, it's so guilt-based and statistically it's not going to make a whole lot of difference if you do that behavior, but it might stress you out a whole lot worrying about not doing it. So um, that's just from a communication standpoint. That's how I kind of have, have been worrying about some of the messaging that's out there because <laughs> people just feel really overwhelmed and guilty. And so trying to figure out how you can capture it in a friendly and, and community building way. And what's the name of your festival again? It's... Get off the grid fest. Get off the grid. Um, okay. I hope to present about it um, on one of these calls later on this summer. Uh, there's we're still. It's taken us a while to get the website up. So once we have the website at a place where I really like it, then I'll, I'll share it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure if Art and Jim's hands are accidentally still up or if they're they're re raised uh, my my hand is for real okay, okay. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll jump in i guess one of the things about um two things so one of them uh, is we have not evolved to think in terms of systems or scale as two examples because we're in we've evolved to re react pretty quickly to what's happening around in the environment around us make quick judgments and those are usually what keep us safe. You know, it's like, it's safer to look and go, whoops, that could be a lion. I'm gonna be doing blah, blah, blah. And so um, one, I think helpful thing about that is to not make people feel guilty uh, about having quote the wrong ideas about being skeptics. Uh, a, there a lot of them are getting total misinformation constantly, but also B, we haven't evolved to be that kind of uh, intelligence. And so I teach about systems and I am, you know, like I totally agree with Frank, it's just amazing how hard it is for people to get the, uh, the gist of what that systems thinking is about. And then uh, the other jump from that is the connection with education. Uh, so um, in the next generation science standards, there's a thing called the cross-cutting concepts, which are the biggest ideas in science and if you look at those, um, actually, there's, uh, I think, seven that they highlight uh, that we uh, uh, notice patterns and cause and effect. Uh, but uh, four of them are actually related to systems. And so systems thinking is crucial to figuring out what's going on and what we can do about it. Uh, because systems thinking on one level teaches us that you mess with a complex system. And I think this gets to uh, Frank's talking about dynamic systems. It's more the complexity of a system. When you mess with a complex system, you're going to get all sorts of things happening that you don't expect. Um, and um, and it, it's counterintuitive a lot of the time. So um, it, it's really hard for people to get and understand. Um, so uh, and then the other one that's very counterintuitive for us is the concept of scale. Um, so we, we, the universe goes from a scale of on both, if you look at time and size, from the incredibly small micro microseconds to billions of years, or in terms of space, the whole universe to uh, an, an atom or even a part of an atom. And uh, we're at the quote macroscopic level of reality. You just go a couple of powers of 10 one way or the other, off from one level of reality to another, and it's a whole different uh, reality. Uh, so uh, just one really quick example, people would think that a hard substance, they know it's made of molecules. So the, the thought is, well, the, a hard thing must have harder molecules. That's what gives us its hardness. And, uh, um, and it's something that's buttery, must have like kind of slippery molecules. And it has nothing to do with that. It's all about the electromagnetic interactions between the molecules and the strength of those interactions. 
Um, so reality is very different than what we would expect it to be. And I'll just close with one big aspect of systems that's very hard for people to get, but if you get it, it changes how you think about reality totally, which is a whole system has properties that are different from the parts. And it's not like two plus two equals five. It's like apples plus oranges equals hip hop dancing. It's, 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 it's just a total different level of reality. And um, I posted on the chat uh, the name of a book that I wrote in 2000 that applied systems thinking to planet Earth. And I don't get any money from it, it's out of print. Uh, but you can get it pretty cheaply and it, it would be a really good primer on systems thinking. Even Give it and, time enforcement. Yeah, okay, that's enough. I put my hand yeah, down. And, and, and I'll just jump in on the, the scale um, mention that we are doing a workshop on uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday rather, <laughs> on scale and climate change and, and very strongly agreeing with Art that we're not, we don't have the evolutionary programming for this that uh, um, until my lifetime um, in the 300,000 years of human history, almost no one needed to know the difference between a thousand, a billion and a million. Um, I said that in the wrong order, but you know what I mean? Um, and now, <laughs> and now we do. Um, and I, and it's really hard to teach and it's not part of our evolutionary programming. And so we're going to talk about that on, uh, Thursday at five o'clock Eastern time, if you're interested in joining us. And now I think, uh, um, Jim is up next, and I'll stop screen sharing. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Don. Uh, these are just a couple update slash announcements. One is right now the uh, the uh, Cheney's the Cheney's co-hosting the Teacher College of Columbia um, Climate Change uh, Symposium, and I've been tuning in on this. I dipped out in order to come here, um, so this is the second day. And tomorrow, I, I think Emily is coming coming up, uh, but uh, but I know that also um, Katie and, and Deb are presenting as well. Um, uh, it's definitely very interesting. It's it's cool to see. And of uh, course, um, you know, I asked Natalie like how influential is te Teachers College? I'm on the West Coast. I don't know as much, and she was just saying that when they do things, it goes into thousands of schools. So it, it's an important thing to to see how they're doing. The other one is the um, STEM Video for All uh, showcase, which is going very well. It's in its last day of comments that's going on. Um, and just one of the things, I mean, there's almost 300 videos, and by going in and discussing other videos and what's going on in them and finding the links to things, that is where a lot of the discussion goes. I mean, just watching my email about responses, and it's just, you know, one of these is just, I mean, Frank, Neopold, you probably get this all the time, but you know the email box is just kind of like bouncing down as you watch. You just watch and say, "Oh God!" <laughs> you never think whenever you write to Frank, God, what he must have to have to deal with. But anyway, that's going on just right now uh, with STEM Video Showcase. But it's very good on on uh, networking, uh, getting things out around climate, and a lot of it is seen that other programs um, have a lot in common with us, but don't see it immediately. There's aspects of what we do or issues that we're doing that are common. And once you go and engage, then they become very interested in clean and the clean network. So um, just, just really good on that. Thank you, Don. Thank you. And Nancy is up next, I think. Yeah, this has been a, such a rich, good discussion. I want to circle back just a little bit more to uh, Laura's project and a concern that came up for me when we were talking about possessions they are guilt inducing. We can't undo them, they're already there. Part of systems thinking is recognizing history and the actual situation you're currently in and focusing on things like co-housing, reusing the material possessions that have already been invested in rather than to have to create more. So I think images of people successfully doing that may be a way of combining the idea of, yes, we individually can live with a great deal less and arguably a lot happier if we use the material possessions we already have created in a way, in a, a somewhat different way. And along with that, one of the driving fears is that to actually be responsive to the needs of climate change at the individual level uh, from the American 
perspective, even if not fully conscious, is the fear of, oh my God, I'll have to start living the way they do in Ghana, which is actually not such a bad way to live. I've been there, but um, we, we don't wanna reinforce that fear that it's going to be about deprivation. It's rather going to be about the enrichment that goes when we can work together more effectively to make better use of the material stuff that we already have. Thanks, Nancy. And Frank G, then Frank N. So I was gonna take the discussion a little bit different direction. I had the sense that maybe Frank Neopold was adding to this discussion. Nope, okay. So um, yeah, uh, got a question for somebody in particular and then for everybody in general. Uh, the, the meeting that I came from just before this meeting was an actual in-person meeting with the neighbor who's got uh, fully vaccinated now. Um, you, everybody remembers those, right? Um, yeah, anyway, what we were talking about, uh, he was a participant in the last virtual bridge in 20, 20, 2019 and we're trying to reboot the organizing committee because there's, uh, well, people gotten involved with various COVID crisis. And so it's sort of dwindled a bit. Um, so we're trying to reboot that whole effort. And um, along those lines, uh, I had a question specifically for Melissa, uh, being from UCAR. Um, apparently, the uh, civil society side, um, the, the what's now called the blue zone, if in fact there's going to be actual people at Glasgow is at the um, uh, Glasgow Science Museum. And I'm just wondering if you, if the, since you're with the, you're, I believe you're with the Science Museum at in Boulder there. So- Yeah, the, the Mesa lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there anything uh, that they're thinking along those uh, lines? in terms of virtually connecting with what's happening with uh, um, what's going on, what will be going on in Glasgow? Well, they haven't set, NCAR and UCAR have not set a date for when the Mesa Lab exhibits will be opening to the public again. So I'm not sure if they're planning on virtually holding events. We did have like a virtual, the, the normal big like family science celebration that we usually have once per year. We did that virtually. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Like, are they planning to like broadcast it or connect with it or something? Well, I'm feeling like maybe I need to touch bases with you offline here somehow sure. Sure. Uh, on that. Yeah. But along those lines, also one of the things that we're looking at uh, came up during the discussion this morning is um, unlike this last bridge that we did, which was the organizing committee organized all the gatherings and everything else, essentially built it, built the structure and then allow it to grow. We're looking more at re, uh, trying to avoid reinventing the wheel. And I know there's been a lot of different, there's been some UNFCCC virtual events uh, uh, UK COP Coalition has had some, uh, 350.org just did a, a, a big thing. And I, I would like to, as anybody hears anything about big events uh, that are sort of virtual communications with what's going on in, um, what's going on in Glasgow, please let me know. Um, because we want to try to avoid reinventing the wheel, but gathering these these different events to make them accessible locally. Anyway, that's enough for me. Okay, Frank in. So Laura, I, I'm I'm struck by um, that most of the, the 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 conversation has been more on the formal education side of the equation, and and just happens to be which part of the community showed up today. But there's a whole nother side, which Frank is alluding to, but I'm thinking specifically about your events and partners that I think the informal education side may bring you more direct transferability than the formal side. Because you know you have a, sh you have a large group with a short amount of time per person kind of opportunity, which is more on the informal side. Um, so uh, 
Uh, I'm thinking about leaders in the field like Jen Kretzer up at the Wild Center, uh, Miranda Massey at Climate Museum in New York City. Some of the stuff that they've been doing on uh, the Climate Signals uh, project or they had the Taking Action um, you know, exhibit they did recently, but there are others. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but there are others. But I, I'm thinking more, and it's too bad that Beth Onis uh, left, but she, I mean, I'm thinking partners that are more on that side of the equation are really going to be helpful to that, that as, and Don, you, you, you have a recent exhibit on, in your institution, right? Yeah, and we just opened in December a new permanent exhibit. So am I, am I, you know, if we think more of the informal side, it might be, I don't know how that works. I don't know, Tennessee, and if anybody's got any, any partnerships that might be, you know, available to you that are more local. But I'm just thinking that that signage and interactives and, and the way the informal uh, side think about this issue are going to be probably more transferable. Um, just this thought. Don, does that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to um, put a link to the exhibit, the online version of the uh, exhibit in the chat. Especially the time. You know, if Billy Spitzer was here, um, you know, another leader in the field uh, on the informal side, you know, just that, that, that time equation is such a critical piece uh, in, the, in the how you design a, um, an intervention. Yes. Right. Like, I mean, you're, 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 I'm, you know, if you take interpretive, uh, which is more from the parks approach on in interpretive education, it's like, how do I engage you and start you on a path? And, and that's really the style. Um, interpretive education, Anita Davis out of NASA, brilliant at this stuff. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully I've given you something to, to follow up on and, and see if there's, there's some, some stuff. Ah, and Patrick, like you're still here. I like you know, the perspective of engage and start people on a path. That's yes. that's an interesting way to look at it. Interpretive education is a whole form of education that is exactly what you're looking at. Park people, this is how they think. Okay, great. Yeah, and um, just uh, seeing the, the comment on uh, science and uh, comedians. <laughs> reminds me uh, I'm of upcoming events in our science in the virtual pub, which I'll put the link in the chat, but just kind of uh, give a, a quick note that um, the June 3rd and June 17th are both uh, climate change related. And Daniel Eisman, Eisman um, is going to be talking about a scientist walks into a virtual pub on uh, stand-up comedy and storytelling with a focus on Climate change, and then June seventeenth, which you can also join join me for a drink on my birthday uh, for June seventeenth. Uh, Steve Byers, who is the lead Earth source heat engineer for Cornell, is going to be talking about the um, Cornell's plan for deep geothermal to heat every building on campus, which is almost three hundred buildings in Ithaca, with our not terribly special uh, geology in Ithaca. It's a really exciting project, and I'm very excited that I'm going to be part of the outreach team for that. But uh, we're we're very early in the process. But uh, Steve's a, a great speaker, and I think that'll be an interesting session. And we've got a comedy one two weeks before that. So, and I'll put the link in the chat for that too. I thought I'd jump in and, and follow up a little bit on what Frank mentioned. And that's, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges I've had in the informal education space with um, one-off events or even things that repeat just a few times is really engaging and keeping that momentum because it's easy for someone to jump in and be like, whoa, this excites me, I'll do it. But then finding those mechanisms to reconnect and move forward uh, is a really interesting challenge. But I also think there's some really innovative solutions one from the action and climate empowerment folks, uh, you know, using text with youth, that was brilliant. What a way to build a, a community and some momentum that wasn't um, necessitated on getting back together in person. And other forms of doing that, like committing to an action 
that uh, leads to something that you create and bring it back together in a given amount of time in a couple of weeks. You know, in the art realm, that can be really powerful, but it doesn't necessarily have to be art. It can just be like a uh, commit to one action and share the story of that action online or in person or, you know, figuring out how to really not just spark action, but follow through with it through these big one-time events, I think is really important. Emily. Emily, go ahead. On the follow-up, um, how do you visualize people doing those follow-up actions, mm -hmm. Patrick? I don't have a working mechanism quite yet, but I think that's kind of what we're beginning to experiment with, with the GIS. I was playing around with survey one, two, three yesterday. And so hopefully, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have links that we can start providing Hello. around. Um, Cheney and I, I have already it. been <laughs> we speak of children um, who are in the meeting with us. Do you want to come say hi? I have a Mars Explorer here. Um, oh, hi. hi. Um, we just drew a space Hello. suit. It's a seal in a space suit. Um, but oh, hello. We, no, it's my turn again, kiddo. Thanks. So, um, so I think what we're going to have is links. I know, sweetie. <laughs> what we're have is links <laughs> to um, that people we can start integrating in other people's projects, so that we can improve that visualization collectively across projects. Um, and so, I don't quite have the mechanism worked out yet, but we are we are putzing with it, Patrick. Um, and and Cheney's. But I've been working with Cheney. Um, in his session, in his seminar this week, to try to figure out some how to integrate that into the the sort of K to twelve work that he's doing. And I'm not sure if Laura or Frank was next. Frank was. <laughs> he says you were, but go ahead, Frank. Okay, so uh, I appreciate folks giving some feedback in terms of what I was talking about, but along those lines, in terms of the meeting that I had this morning, one thing that would be very helpful to me right now in this sort of rebooting and re-strategizing for an event that we're not sure is going to happen when it's scheduled to happen and so on, um, is I would love to actually have a separate time to chat with whoever in this group would be interested about this problem of how to reboot for uh, what a virtual bridge would look like in a local community, how to reboot for it, um, just anything along those lines. So is, is, would there be anybody who would be interested in having a conversation like that with me? And I may be able to drag some of our local organizing committee in with me as well. You know, Frank and I have already talked about this a little bit, and I yeah. to continue the discussion. So um, the Museum of the Earth might serve as, serve as a hub. Yep. Anyway, email me if you're if uh, you'd be interested in that conversation. I'll try to set one. Up, try to set up a Zoom call. Okay, and Laura. Yeah, um, going back to Patrick's comment about that, that's one of the things I think that lacks in our festival is that we don't have any um, follow up action. What we found, we have four different components to the festival, arts and community, health and wellness, food and agriculture and energy and environment. And we find that the people that come to speak at each of these all share a commonality, they want to walk gently upon the earth, but they've never brought themselves from their individual communities into a meta community. Um, they're still apart. And so that would be good if to be for us to be able to have some follow-up and some sort of structure. Hopefully we will evolve to the to the point where we're training people in that area how to create the same festival. And then that doing the community festival, building a festival themselves will allow um, for more interaction between the different areas. Okay, um, then Emily and then Ginger, I think. 
Nope, sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. Okay, and Ginger? Um, something you might be able to do since this, especially since agriculture is your theme um, and a follow-up thing, I'm thinking August um, timeframe, you could have composting instructions like backyard composting, vermicomposting. So even if you're in an apartment, in an apartment, you can do the little Rubbermaid worm bins, you know, and um, you maybe have like, that would be something where people could check in as a follow-up, the, the post festival, compare your compost, how's your compost doing, um, going into fall and yard waste and breaking down your garden. Bring your new, bring your new worm friends to meet. Right, them. right. And I think, and that way too, I think that the really cool thing about vermiculture is that you can do it in an apartment and you can have a small Rubbermaid bin to compost your stuff um, and, and take it, you know, if you don't have house plants, take it out and throw it on the green, the, the park strip in front of your house. So that might be a cool um, action that people could engage in. And I have some other ideas. Laura, can you put your email in the chat so that I can just email you offline, please? Yeah. And it is just about two o'clock. Um, so about time to call it a wrap. One thing that I forgot to mention for um, folks in the clean leadership board, I did actually talk with uh, Casey Bush about network analysis and she's interested in helping us out. And I told her we would get back to her, to her at some point. So she knows that's an interest and is interested in helping out. Uh, hey, Don, uh, some, uh, I just wanted to alert you to the, the idea. I, I mean, Laura, you got, you got a full, robust conversation today. Um, <laughs> but this new paper by Ed and Tony and crew uh, on Six Americas and the history of the, the segmentation over time, one of the questions I want to know is, how do you shift the Six Americas breakdown over time? How do you shrink the disengaged convert the cautious to concerned or alarmed and then activate the alarmed so they're not concerned but they're actually activated and there's sort of like there's a seventh america that i've been talking with them about but we gotta we gotta actually see change in these numbers they're fairly flat since 2008 there's a little bit of difference but uh we that we got to see a very different breakdown in the next 10 years and that's where we come in uh, so, uh, but we have data, so we could actually yeah. see if we make a difference, move a needle. Anyway, that's a large conversation. Right. I uh, just want to tee it off somewhere down the line. We got to talk about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, Laura, did you? Yes, Laura's got a hand up. Go ahead. Oh, um, that's fine. I know we're at the time, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank everyone. I've got copious notes good ideas to go back on my search for speakers. And I just want to let you on it, like in Tennessee, I found that there are so many people that are doing things towards climate, but they haven't come together yet as a group and from the Southeast. And, you know, we're some years behind <laughs> other parts of the country, but it's ripe area for action. Alrighty. Well, we should uh, call it because I think some of us have other meetings uh, to head to and some have emerged for an, the next meeting here, I think. So good seeing you all and uh, have a good week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.